You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. And welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. One of the things you may know about me is that I am a football fan. More specifically, I'm an Atlanta Falcons football fan. And one of my favorite Atlanta Falcons players of all time is a member of their 1998 Super Bowl team, former fullback Bob Christian. Bob has an incredible story from his days at Northwestern University, his long journey just to get a chance in the NFL, and how he ended up playing for two legendary coaches along the way. Today, he's a pilot for a charter company known as Brazos Valley Air. And by the way, he's also an electrical engineer by trade and may very well have had a hand in designing the cell phone tower network that you are using to listen to this podcast. Here he is, without further delay, former NFL running back Bob Christian, my guest on this edition of At The Mic. From my favorite football team, this is such a treat for me, man. The Atlanta Falcons, fullback, when they went to the Super Bowl in 1998. Thanks for making time, man. Oh, no problem at all. I'm glad we finally worked this out. I know we've tried for several weeks here. Yes, I'm so glad that this finally happened. You've been so gracious with your time in trying to make this happen. I want to just start at the beginning, because you were born in St. Louis, Missouri, correct? That's right. How long were you there? We lived in Florissant. Florissant is a suburb of St. Louis, and and no one used to know where Florissant was, and until I recently, I've been able to say, well, it's it's we were part of the Ferguson Florissant School District. Yeah, Ferguson puts it on the map, unfortunately, but um, it's a nice little town that's that's on the north uh, northern suburbs of St. Louis. Okay, very good. All right, and so you grew up there. You have an older sister and a younger brother. I have to ask you. Are they athletes as well? Did they grow up playing sports like you? <laughs> um, yes. My sister, she was actually a swimmer. That was her main uh, athletic sport. She also was on the cheerleading squad and all that, but she competed uh, in swimming. She was more individual. She, she kind of liked swimming, especially, the, I don't know, she's not me at all. <laughs> she uh-huh. liked the long distance. Oh, yeah. Just go in the water <laughs> and, and swim by yourself for, you know, the next, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it was. Uh-huh. My brother played uh also played football and, and uh, baseball and, and and actually he he was a soccer player and when I started playing football and then he eventually he ended up switching over to play football too so so did they go on as adults to like play professionally or in college or anything no, like that no my, my brother played um, he played at Northwestern also okay um, so so he he kind of followed me up there and uh, we had one year playing together which was awesome oh that, that's what that was my next question yeah yeah how cool is that what position was he playing he was a linebacker. Okay. And uh, oh no, so, did you have to go up against him in practice? Oh yeah. No, no. <laughs> and I and I and I really got kind of mad at him, like in, on a Thursday practice, which you know is supposed to be kind of light, you know, and you're not really yeah. supposed to do a lot of hitting. You know, you're running through the plays, and we were on the goal line, and I was like three yards past the goal line. He came from the other side and just decked me. You know, wait, I'm, what I'm letting was... up, and I'm like. <laughs> I kind of got mad at him about right. that. <laughs> Did the coaches get mad too? I would hope. Yeah, I think so. I but. mean, wait, wait was, was something going on in your life with him? Were you guys having a fight? No, or no, you, just <laughs> he just wanted to hit you. Yeah, yeah, he just. Um, oh, no. I guess to pay me back for all those things I did to him growing up. I but. guess so. He he realized. <laughs> Oh, no. I'm only going to be on the team with my brother. This is my last chance to, to oh, yeah, yeah. physically. <laughs> so so he, he decked me, um, oh. but, it, but it was unfair. He blindsided me. Yeah. But anyway, I, I forgave him. Yeah, well, you're a kind <laughs> guy. All right. So you went to school and you majored at Northwestern in electrical engineering. Correct. Was playing football professionally on your mind while you were going to school or were you thinking i'm just i'm gonna go on and be an electrical engineer it was it was actually from spring of my freshman year we hired uh, randy walker who ended up being the head coach at northwestern okay years later and he became my running backs coach for my uh sophomore and junior year and um in spring football and we had we had uh, byron sanders I, i don't know if you guys know that name but uh he has a brother named barry that um <laughs> is uh is pretty well known sounds familiar um, yes yeah he, he was one of the most phenomenal running backs ever to play absolutely and his brother byron you know he was a year older than me and he was at northwestern with me and so you know going in the spring ball i'm just trying to you know i'm trying to make my mark and and i'm like man you know byron you know byron's there and and after spring ball you know we had to have a meeting with our coach and we go over the goals you know for that next season 
you know, I come in there and I'm, I'm sitting down, you know, across from Randy Walker. And he, and he said, all right, my goal for you is that when you get done playing here at Northwestern, you play on Sundays. And it, and it blew me away. I'm like, was that the first time in your life that someone had said, even even hinted at you playing professionally? Or had you heard that along the line? Um, I mean, sure, people just like, hey, you know, like sure. dreaming, you know, uh-huh. but, but... But this was someone of authority. And, and it was incredible so. because at North Carolina, right. he, he coached, not directly, but he, Lawrence Taylor was there. Yeah. And, and um, there was a running back, too, that he had coached that went on and played in the NFL. I'm trying to remember the, the name. I'm, I'm blanking. But anyway, I knew that he knew what it took. And that's what he said. You know, I, my goal is that you play on Sundays because I think you got what it takes. You know, Now he said, is it going to be easy? No. You're going to have to work your tail. Yes, but... Mm-hmm. Those words and that, that belief that he had in me um, was a big part of, of why I became what I became. If he thought I could do it, then I, you know, I'm not going to let him down. You know. And he's one of the guys in your life who has had the biggest impact on you, and it's pretty obvious as to why now. It sounds like he was the first person to, I guess, really believe in you and see you playing on Sundays. Right, yeah. and, and belief is huge. I mean, it's the difference between winning and losing mm-hmm. in, in everything, really. You can't accomplish something unless you believe you can. And I think, too, like, you know, I, I grew up with, with parents that loved one another, that loved us, that, you know, family was most important. And, you know, my parents were always, always there for me, always believing in me, always, you know, encouraging me to try things. They didn't worry about me failing. I even played hockey. Like <laughs> that was probably the bravest thing I ever did. Oh yeah, um, and most humiliating. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but my sophomore year in high school, you know, like my neighbors across the street, you know, a hockey coach and their son played hockey, and, and so I'd go watch them. I said, oh man, it looks like fun. And I had skated all my life, you know, out at my grandparents. They lived on a lake, you know, and and um, and I thought I could skate well until I, until I tried to do it while you know. Right. And, and, and those, <laughs> it's it's like. It, I don't know. And the guys I were playing with, they had been, they had been playing since they were like five or so, you know, so mm-hmm. they were skating circles around me. I was a fish out of water. And, uh, but my parents, and it cost money too, because it cost, you know. The equipment is ridiculous. I know. My son played hockey briefly, uh, and we were looking, he played inline hockey. And even that equipment was ridiculous. But then we looked into possibly playing ice hockey. My goodness, are you for real? It's a fortune just to get your kids suited up on the ice. Right. You know, but it was it w- that desire to do it wouldn't go away. My parents, and they supported me, and we went out and bought some used hockey equipment. That, you know, and I didn't care. I, I just wanted, just wanted to try to it. Yeah. And I didn't want them to spend a lot of money. You know, I was already like, oh, I know it's going to cost, you know. But, you know, I got, I got to go try it. And, you know, I humiliated myself. And <laughs> How long did you end up playing that sport? I just won. That, it was a summer league. It was just for fun. It was just, a, uh-huh. you know. And had you been, as a kid, playing Pop Warner football and moving up, you know, middle school, high school, along um, that same time? I started playing baseball. That was the first sport I played. Okay. Um, when I was, like, in third grade. And then I played soccer starting in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. And I always wanted to play football. Now, my parents, uh, at first, they were like, oh, well, we don't want you to get hurt. Right. And um, I can understand that. And then I had a friend that played, and, and, and their parents, talking to my parents, said, oh, it was horrible. The coaches were, like, degrading and all that. You know, he had a bad experience. Huh. And so that kind of, you know, I finally got them to say, okay, when you get to junior high, when you get to seventh grade, you can start playing. So, sure. So I started playing football in seventh grade. What positions were you playing as a kid? Let's see. And, and I'm, I'm fortunate, like, my – Junior football coach, Coach O'Brien, he was he was an awesome coach too. He wanted us to get an experience too. Not so I played a bunch of different positions. Like my first year, oh, I was a tight end on offense, and then I played middle linebacker on defense. And then uh, the next year, but then for some reason he he switched it up into playoffs. <laughs> he moved, what? yeah, yeah. He moved me from tight end to to halfback, I think. Uh oh. Uh, like huh. in the playoffs, and then and then the next year I started off playing wide receiver. And I moved to offensive tackle, like for the playoffs, which, you know, that, that, that may seem kind of weird, but, um, mm-hmm. but I'm I'm glad because, yeah. you know, and I think part of it is just um, to to expose expose me to a bunch of different things, you know, and 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 being a part of the line is definitely, you know, it's a good experience for anybody to go through, you yeah. know. You move up through middle school, high school, college, and so on, and then you get to the NFL draft. Yes. Right. What year was it that you? graduated from it was 91 when you were with northwestern was that the year y'all went to the rose bowl no nope. no nope, that was no that was 95 shoot okay so i missed I that right unfortunately there. yes yeah. yes yeah. okay i wish uh, i could say i had that yeah. kind of success in college but it, uh, <laughs> no but it wasn't that way okay 
So take us to that experience of how did you find out where were you? Who <laughs> called you to say, hey, uh, you were just drafted by, it was the uh, Atlanta, Atlanta Falcons, Falcons right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in my dorm room. I was trying to fix my computer. <laughs> um, so it's not like you were sitting around watching ESPN, waiting for the call. To no, I spent, I spent the whole rest of the day doing that. You know, it was the second day of the draft. You know, the first day they get through the first three rounds, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, and while I was trying not to be hopeful, but, you know, you still like, well, what if I get a yeah. call? You know, and well, no. Okay. The next day, got up, mm-hmm. I'm ready, and I just sat around, Oh no! sat around, sat around, sat around. Were you glued to the TV or just... Well, I didn't have a TV. Oh, uh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I don't even think I had a radio. I'm trying to think. I, I was just... Um, we didn't even have internet back then. Oh, yeah. Right. So I'm trying to think how I... I'm just waiting by my phone. Just waiting by the phone, staying busy, huh? Yeah, and then... Um, well, not really. I was At first, I was just waiting, but then after a while, I mean, yeah, I was starting to get discouraged. Want and to take your mind off of it, huh? And so... I, I remember I had some problem with my computer. My parents were there with me too. My dad dad was an electrical engineer too. So okay. So we decided to take my computer apart and try to fix the problem. So so we were doing that. That takes your mind off of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we were doing that when uh, the Falcons, uh, the running backs coach for the Falcons called and and said, hey, you know, we're thinking of drafting you, you know, for their next pick, you know, and and of course they're like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. And so they uh, they drafted me. Um, in, in the 12th round there, which is the last round, which is uh, kind of... Um, is that the same year they drafted Brett Favre? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was a rookie with Brett. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's fun. So okay. it was uh, it's actually kind of fun. Like, I ended up playing him a bunch. Like, you know, when I was in Chicago and he was in Green Bay, right. we played right. twice a year. Mm-hmm. And then in Atlanta, my last three, two years in Atlanta, we played him like three times. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as a rookie right there with the Falcons, how long were you with them before because you got cut by them right i got cut um like glanville was the head coach i was about to say um, back in black and uh i think he really did like me he said later like my dad one time he was he was uh announcing one of our games we were playing san francisco and i had a nice block to help jamal anderson score and he's oh, like oh we're gonna talk about that <laughs> and um and glanville was like yeah that bob christian i drafted him and uh-huh. you know whatever you know out of northwestern and you know he was like so my, my dad said uh he didn't mention he cut you <laughs> right i was gonna say Come but on. but i had a feeling that i think i think it was like the general manager that that kind of made the decision because like the day the practice you know there was the game and then the practice and then the next day they have to cut you know and and telling me that you know some guys saved their job today and, and he said specifically i had a great day you know so i think in his mind he Oh, he, he wanted to keep me, but, but, you know, he didn't have full control of, of the players. So, sure. And, um, so, so then after you get cut there, you ended up playing in Europe, right? Well, actually or, I didn't, I didn't make it to Europe. What happened? Uh, well, the world football league, they had all their tryouts in Orlando. All the teams were there together. Okay. Um, practicing and I got and everything. And, um, yeah, this, this was crazy. Cause because was this right after you got cut that you no, decided? No, okay, this was... So how much um, time passed between Falcons cutting you as a rookie and your London Monarchs thing? No, uh, that was in the spring. So the London Monarchs was like in... I think we went to like either January or February. Okay. So there was... I got cut and... Um, you know, but I was still hopeful. I still like, okay, you know, maybe someone's going to pick me up. And, and so when I first got cut, I actually went back to my high school and they only had one coach for the freshman team. And, and so... I'm training and trying to stay ready, but, but I'll come help. So I, I helped coach the freshman at my high school, oh, cool. um, you know, for a while. But then I also realized I had a few classes I had to finish. Um, oh. cause I, I, um, <laughs> I don't know, like my, my senior year I, I took, for some reason, my, my advisor, he thought, you know, I had, to, I had to decide on what class I was going to take. And I had some unrestricted electives and, you know, I was going to take a speech class because I, I thought that, Hey, I'm starting to get asked to speak sometimes, you know, and it might be nice if I actually had some training, you know, right? <laughs> and, um, and he's, Oh, you could take that at any, you know, junior college, you know, while you're at Northwestern, why don't you, you know, so he advised me to take four electrical engineering courses. And, um, one of them particularly like sunk me and we had to write a computer program every week. And, and it was, um, oh. taking up all my time. Yeah. And plus I'm trying to run for the scouts and all that. So I ended up actually dropping that class, um, which, which then put me behind for graduating that year. So, so I knew I'd have to come back for, you know, some classes. So that fall after I didn't get a call and I decided, well, I might as well go back and, you know, try to finish. So I went back to Northwestern and then the Colts, like right before, um, yeah, it's toward the end of the season, they, they brought me in for a workout because they had had someone, some injuries and, and, and that, the system was different back then. Uh-huh. You know, if you got injured, 
they could put you on injured reserve, and th- then you didn't count towards the 45 active players. Okay. And then they could sign somebody else. And then, but what happened all the time, like, you know, someone's injured, they put them on injured reserve, they sign some other people, they come in, the person gets healthy, then they cut those people, you know. Mm-hmm. And so the Colts wanted to sign me to the practice squad for that, you know, the last few weeks because um, someone had gotten hurt. But then I talked to my professors. I said, okay, if I take an incomplete, you know, can I, can I take an incomplete and come back after the season and finish up whatever I, you know, and, and almost all of them were like, oh, no, we got too much left or whatever. They, they wouldn't do it. At this point, like financially too, I'm like, okay, if I go for a week on a practice squad, I'll make $3,000 or whatever, you know. But to pay to go back to Northwestern for a whole nother quarter is going to be like six grand, you know. So I told the um, general manager, and it wasn't Bill Polian. It was the previous uh, general manager. I told him, like, can you give me some kind of guarantee, you know, because basically if I leave school, I'm going to have to pay out of my pocket to go back. And I'll, I mean, I'll come, you know, as long as you kind of guarantee that I'll make at least that one way or the other, you know. <laughs> And then, and then he got back to me. He said, look, why don't you just finish school? We want to sign you for next year. This sh- season's shot for us anyway. And then they called back a few weeks later. Say, hey, we want you to play in the World Football League in the spring, get some okay. experience. And, and every team had to have a certain number of players that they allocated to the World League. They wanted me to be one. And so they sent me um, to try out with uh, the London Monarchs. And uh, I go to Orlando. That's where all the tryouts were. Okay. And there, there was one coach that there was no doubt about it. He just had it out for me for some, whatever reason. I, I don't know. And, and he, he brought up any opportunity to tear me down, he did, you know. And uh, so I was kind of going through that the first week. And then they had, the, you know, the first scrimmage and this big speech. You know, we haven't been evaluating up to this point, but if you want to make this team, you know, starts today, all, all this. So I'm like, okay. And so I went out, and I had a great scrimmage. Like, um, like every time I – I think I touched the ball four times – and like two of those, I was by everybody and they whistled it dead. The other two times, it was like 10 yard gains, you know. And so. You're feeling pretty good. Yeah, I was feeling great, yeah. you know. And, and some of the guys who were on the team the year before were like, oh, yeah. One of them said something kind of cryptic, you know. It's like, I love it. I love it because it's going to mess with, you know, I think this coach. Had, <laughs> and um, I mean, they knew what was going on more than I did. So I'm like, okay, you know, I was getting excited. You know, hey, I'm going to get to go to London and, you know. Yeah. Were and, you looking forward to living over there? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, hey, I. I'm adventurous. I love to see new things. So the next morning we were off. I, I, I went and found a church somewhere in the um, area. And, you know, when I got back, everyone was like, hey, did Coach find you? Did Coach find you? He was looking for you. Did Coach find you? You know, I went and found him. And he's like, he brought me in and, and sat me down and said, hey, hey, Bobby, uh, here's what we're going to do. Like, we're going to try to trade you to uh, one of the other teams. If they won't do it, then we're going to cut you. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it, you know. And, yeah. and at that point, for him to say that to me after, but that happens in life, you know, you, you get with some people, they, they don't like you for whatever reason. I mean, it was a learning experience. I won't, I won't say it was a fun one, but mm-hmm. the World League was so, it was like going back to high school almost as far, I mean, I mean, the level of play was higher than, than high school and college, Yeah. but we had to carry our own, we basically had to do our own laundry. We had to like, uh-huh. you know, we were, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, um, it was kind of a low budget league, huh? Right, right. So well, I'll just go you know, play for the Colts. Cause I thought they still wanted to sign me. Mm-hmm. But, but after this experience, it turned out, even though they, they kind of kept telling me, Oh, don't worry. We're going to, you know, we're going to sign you, but we got to take care you know, we got to figure out what our plan B situation. And then they got to figure out their draft situation. And then they drafted three running backs and said, oh, sorry, we don't need you. No. Okay. So you're drafted by the Falcons. Mm-hmm. Cut. You're trying out for the London Monarchs. Cut. You're given the runaround by the Indianapolis Colts. Mm-hmm. What are you thinking about football at this point? Um, well, I'm, I'm a man of faith, so I'm, I'm, you know, I spend every day praying and seeking God. And my words to him was like, all right, what else do you want me to do? <laughs> sure. Like what? what <clears throat> Basically, yeah. football's not working out. Uh-huh. And then he responded. Sounded like that. All right. <laughs> It was. Um, I'm sorry. I, I was waiting for this. No, here no. Here comes. Here comes. It's going to be dramatic. It, it was. No, no, you know, it was. It was in silence. Yeah, for for a long time, you know, because my question was, what else do you want me to do? You know. Uh huh. And and this may sound weird, you know, but it's hard. Like you have to have some hope to keep trying, right? Yeah. And the thing that 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 defeats dreams more than anything is discouragement and and despair. And you know, I was trying to keep ready. I, I was out on the track. I had a friend um, who was a track coach. He gave me this workout, (laughs) mostly like 200 yard wind sprints, you know, with, you know, you let your heart rate recover to just a certain amount. And then, you know, this one day I remember I'm I'm sitting out there running it and it's no fun. Yeah. So you're keeping in shape. Right. For 
what, what may or may not become a right. job for you. I, I ran this one sprint and, and my ears were burning, you know, like mm-hmm. and my heart was pounding and, and you know, lungs burning. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm dying at the end of this sprint. And I started having these thoughts like, why am I doing this? Right. Why am I putting myself through all this torture when I'm not even I'm not even getting a tryout at this point? Every team in the league had their, their tryout roster filled. Hmm. I wasn't on it. Why am I doing this? And this may sound weird, but I, I never try to memorize this first. You know, even though I re- read the Bible and try to read it regularly, Proverbs 14, 23 just kind of popped into my head. It says, all hard work brings profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And so I just... Wow. It just brought to my attention, okay, all hard work brings profit. I'm like, yeah, okay, God, but what profit or wind sprints going to bring <laughs> if I'm going to go be an engineer? I mean, like uh-huh. last I checked, engineers don't really have to run, you know, <laughs> um, especially, you know, fast and, you know, and be in great shape like that. But I, I'm, I'm thinking, what profit can that bring? And then Proverbs 3, 5 popped in my head, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. And, and I remember specifically just feeling like God's just saying, hey, trust me. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. And, and I remember I had to make a specific choice. Like, okay, I feel like God's saying just trust him and keep working. I, I don't have no idea why. I can either decide to do what makes sense to me and just forget it. I'm going to go home. You know, I'm, I'm going to get my resume going to, all, you know, all these companies and, and, and just, you know, get on with finding that next chapter in life. Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to keep running wind sprints and lifting weights and doing all the other things. And see what happens. So, huh? you know, and I remember specifically I had to decide. I had to decide, and, and I said, okay, I'm going to trust God, even though it seems to make no sense. And, and, you know, even telling the story, some people may think I'm, I'm, you know, goofy, but I kept training. And then just before training camp, the San Diego Chargers called up. And we're now in what, 1992? This is 92. Okay. Yes, the uh, summer of 92. Sure. So just before training camp, the Chargers called up, and they said, we, we had a, um, a running back that we drafted that came into minicamp out of shape and wasn't working hard. And, and they said, we'd rather give you a shot than him because we know that you at least will come and camp in shape and work wow. hard once you get there. And I'm like, well, thank God I'm still in no shape. No kidding. <laughs> thank God, literally. And so I go to San Diego, and I'm, I'm like, man, this is my last shot, you know. Yeah. They were up front. I, I had a lot of respect for uh, the Chargers organization at that time because they told me, we have four running backs. We know we're going to keep. We might keep five. And they ran a one-back situation. So so I was competing for a maybe four, fifth – string spot on that squad you know but i gotta do well and and i was working my tail off. i always work my tail off um and and on that first you know after the first week you know again a lot of, a lot of teams always do that they have a good scrimmage you know like more game game like situation and and i pulled my hamstring oh uh, and, and you were still you're a halfback at this point? yeah yeah i played wow. i've been a halfback in college and and so yeah i'm still and so you're hoping for a fifth string job and you get injured right so with a hamstring you can't push it you know i played with a broken back before you can push that but it wasn't the um spine spine you know the bones that protect the spine it was one of those transverse processes a little bone that stick out the side but there's some things you can play through but a hamstring you just can't because it's not going to heal it's just going to get worse and worse if unless you let it heal so i had to sit out for like a week and a half not a good time to be sitting out huh yeah and their trainer one day it was it was I know now the deal was they wanted to cut me, but they can't cut you when you're hurt. Okay. So they have to get you on film performing and then they can cut you. So he's like, he just said, Hey, the tr- you know, the coaches say they want to see you out there. And so I'm like, well, you're the trainer. You think I'm ready? You know, do you think I'm in danger of doing it again? And he said, Oh, they, you know, they say, want to see you out there. And I said, well, you know, I think I can go, you know? And, and so I, I went out there and I pulled it again. <laughs> and then the trainer was wow. mad because he's like, oh, you know, cause they wanted to, get me out there so they can let me go. And sure. so then I was kind of like a dead man walking for the next two weeks, you know, and, and I knew it too at that point. It was uh, one of those situations where, you know, everyone knows too. Everyone knows I'm gone, mm-hmm. but I got to be there because whatever. And that, that was a hard, that was a hard situation. So at the end of that, it was like the last preseason game before the, the cut, you know, while I was healthy and they, you know, they, they, they had me there, but they didn't even put me in and then they cut me. But I had plans to go to Disney or Sea World the next day. <laughs> yeah, like I, I mean, I already knew I, what was going to happen. I already made plans. I'd already talked to my, my 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 mom's aunt was in town, so my great aunt was in like visiting one of my mom's cousins who lived in San Diego, and we actually we had a lot of I had a lot of fun with her that that week because we I just stayed. I said, hey, 
you know, can you just send me back, you know, a little later? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I went and, you know, got it, you know, when you're in training camp, you don't get to see all the things. So, right. so yeah, we, we, we had it all planned out. I already knew what was going to happen, mm. but, um, and I thought it was over at that point. I thought it's over. Yeah. You know, any common sense would say it's over. You know, I spent a little few extra days in San Diego, then went back home, St. Louis. And on Labor Day, 1992, out of the blue, I was, I was out at my grandparents for the day, you know, on Labor Day, and then got home that night on the answer machine. There was um, a scout for the Bears that had called in and said that they were wanting to bring me in for a workout that next day. What are you thinking at this point? After getting the runaround from one NFL team, getting cut by two other NFL teams, getting cut by the uh, NFL Europe team, uh, are you at this point thinking, are you excited that the Chicago Bears are calling you? Or are you? Well, I'm, I'm shocked and excited. I'm like, oh my God, and scared because I'm like, they called that morning. I was gone. I see. And then I'm like, oh no, they want to bring people in to work them out. And you, you're and, afraid you might miss your chance. Yeah. Because this is before we, kids, you know, the ones of, of you that had to look up who Barry Sanders is, mm-hmm. um, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have instant communication. If you weren't there, yeah, you're not there. You're just not there, and and answer machines. Uh, you know. Yeah, we had just gotten out. I, I was I just about to say that was kind of a new thing too at that point. It was. So I, so I ended up that night. I mean, I booked the first flight from St. Louis to Chicago in the morning. My brother was still going to school at Northwestern, and, and he met me at the airport. And then on a payphone, I called the Bears <laughs> and said, "Oh, you know, I'm here." And oh, good. And so come on by. So we we drive up to Lake Forest, and and I was thinking. For the Falcons, I you know, five weeks at mini camp, training camp, all that, doing everything I can, nothing. A lot of monarchs. Well, it was only a week, but you know, mm-hmm. nothing. You know, but, but again, had to work hard, do everything I can, San Diego. And I'm like, I'm gonna have to have the most amazing try. You know, I'm gonna have to catch every ball they throw. They're gonna have me do all this stuff. So they had me run a 40. And then after I got to run the 40, they say, okay, go get a shower. We'll get a contract ready. At this point, I'm like, <laughs> I'm pinching myself, like, is, right. is this real? Right. And uh, yeah, because, I mean, the season, if it's after Labor Day, they must have, it must have been time to, to start the season. Yeah, that. and this was for the practice squad, and I knew. Okay, oh, for yeah. the practice squad. Yeah, but yeah, still, so it was the practice still, squad. You, you hardly had to do anything for I know. the contract. So I, they, they say, well, all right, you know, we want you to get a physical, though, just the team doctor. He was a Northwestern doctor, you know, down at Northwestern's uh, hospital uh, in Chicago. So I had to go down there, get, get my physical, and... You know, on the way down there, I'm just like, I am just, I'm praising God. I'm like, thank you, Lord. You must I be mean, on cloud nine at this point. I was. And then um, then like another little verse popped in my head. <laughs> uh, Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I, I kind of felt like God was saying, hey, you know, because, you know, through all this process, you know, you 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 know, you, you, you kept looking to me, you kept, you delight me. And that's what I, I kind of thought at the time. And I just like, so amazed, you know, that I'm, I'm having this opportunity. You know, it's just the practice squad, but... You know, I wasn't going to look back either. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, all the defense, they still had like uh, Singletary and Richard Dent and the Fridge and uh, Steve McMichael. And, uh, you know, they had a l- bunch of those those guys were on still the defense. There. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, most of them hated me. Most of the defense hated yeah. me. <laughs> uh, well, hold on. I saw something. I read something where during lunchtime or something of a practice uh, day, you were informed that there was a bounty on your head. What yes. was that all about? Yeah, one one of the, the defensive tackles, God. you know, he we're going through lunch and he just kind of like, hey, watch yourself out there today, and you know, and he he said, I guess somebody put up some money if anybody takes me out of practice, you know. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was kind of funny when it, it was just interesting from my perspective. Yeah. Like, you know, years later, like I guess there was the Saints, you know, they were mm-hmm. putting up bounties for something, you know, yeah. and I thought that was kind of funny because I'm like, well, you know, that happened. <laughs> You're my own teammates today. Right, your own teammates. Somebody's put up money. I know. Who are you upsetting Right. to the point where they're doing that? And it's funny, like later in my career, like when Keith Brookings was a rookie. Sure. And, um, you know, he's a first-round draft pick, but, mm-hmm. you know, hey, you got you to play scout team, you know, and he was going full speed. And usually, you know, like especially during the season, you know, like in fullbacks, I used to get stinger. Everyone, you know. Mm-hmm. get stingers you know and a lot of times you hate it when you get it in practice because then it's still jacked up for the game you know and and explain a stinger a what, stinger yeah. is when your your neck gets compressed it can be two two ways either the nerve gets stretched you know if your head goes one way and your shoulder goes the other way or if your neck gets compressed where where the uh the bones compress on the nerve that goes you know f- out from your neck down your arm and um if you ever see someone like after a play just their arms limp and they're uh-huh. like ah, 
it hurts. You know, it's basically like hitting your funny bone, right. but starting at your neck. And um, yeah. and so it's that's gotta be scary. fairly common with fullbacks. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, <laughs> so Keith's going crazy, you know, and I'm like, and at this point I'm the veteran. And, yeah, and, and you just, know. <laughs> just so people who, who maybe aren't familiar with Atlanta Falcon players, uh, Keith Brooking is the guy who, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, before each game, will make sure that he slams his helmet against the bridge of his nose in order to cut it before every game. Is that not accurate? You know what? I don't know. Okay, okay. Sorry. I'm pretty sure because he wants to I didn't know he did it on purpose. Blood. I knew there was always... But okay, but yes, so he is he is intense. Right, no, Continue. he's intense. And yes. he, you know, he's a first-round pick, and he played <laughs> uh, most of his career in Atlanta, but he also played for Dallas, I think, at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, he did. And, you know, and he, was, he was a great player. I think uh-huh. a pro bowler, at, yeah. at, at, at maybe several times. But, you know, when he was a rookie, you know, and he's, I'm like, yep, that was me. <laughs> You know, I would go hard, and one play in particular with the Bears, we were getting ready to play uh, Detroit, you know, Barry Sanders. And, 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 you know, the big thing that they were harping on is, like, that sprint draw. You run and shoot, you know, the mm-hmm. back's always going to block the edge, and the quarterback, you know, kind of the half roll and then throw it down the field. But, but there's a play where the tackle just kind of steps to get the end going up the field and throws him up the field, and he goes and gets the backer. And then, you know, they slip Barry the ball, and he comes in underneath that mm-hmm. the, the end, and, and there's no one there, right? So um, I'm sure the ends were like, hey, just really be careful of that, that play. And so he, he sat on it. I got the ball, but he's he's already tight. You know, he didn't get thrown up the field. And so I bounced to the outside, and, you know, he kind of got his fingertips on my shoulder pad, you know. You, you know, kind of the in during the season, don't tackle. You know, it's like you get in position. Teams have to learn how to work together to help each other get better without injuring right. people, you know. So... You have an ethic as a running back. If a guy's in position, I'm not going to try to run him over. He gets me, I stop, you know. But he just got his fingertips on me. That wouldn't stop me. So I kept going and, you know, made him look bad. And, and, and Richard was mad. And, and after the play, you know, he's coming up to me. He's, he's strutting up with his hand out, pointing at me. He's saying, you know. And who's doing um, this? Richard Dent. Richard Dent. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then Singletary just got up in my face and said, good job. Good job. <laughs> and now that sounds and right. Keep it up. And, you know. <laughs> And he said, we need it. You know, he, I'm like, okay. So, so Mike, you know, he encouraged me to keep going hard and make everyone work on defense. But most of the other guys didn't like that. So, but I'm like, hey, and, if, and if is that- Mike's saying that, you know, I had, had, you know, Mike had the most respect of anybody yeah. on that team, you yeah. know. And, and so I'm like, all right, if, if he's telling me to go hard and keep it up, I'm going to keep it up. And so was that the genesis of the bounty then on you, do you think? or And how much was that? I mean, how much are you worth? Come on. I don't know. <laughs> It, it was probably a hundred bucks, you know, because, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, it was common back then. Somebody, I'm not going to say any names of anybody, they would do it, but it, and it was a lot like you're watching film before the game, you know, the special teams and, and it's like some of the veterans who were making a bunch of money wanted to encourage like these, mm-hmm. these, um, you know, like the rookies and, and guys, you know, on special teams, you know, cause they know how important special teams are, you know. I got a hundred dollars for a big hit on kickoff or whatever, you know, and yeah. it wasn't so much take that guy out, but it's like, you know, they're offering up some cash for, for a big play. So, and, um, okay. So you were with the bears for three seasons. Yeah. Three seasons. Mike Dicko's last season, he sat me down, like I'm on this practice squad all year. They activate me for the last two games because they, they want to give me a shot to play. How excited were you? I was super excited. And, um, I only played special teams, you know, in, the, in that first game, but I, I sprained my foot. You know, I, on the, it was AstroTurf, you know, and I think someone also stepped on my, you know, kind of stepped on my foot as I'm planting, and, and, and I had like a midfoot sprain. Do you know who uh, you were playing, obviously? Uh, Detroit, actually. Okay, so um, it was on almost the turf then was probably just the, the concrete Yeah, underneath. it was the old school. Yeah, it was like... How was it to play on that kind of surface? Because I... I you know, I used to watch those games, right. and you, you go back and you listen to how it was just a thin layer of carpet, effectively, on top of a slab of cement. How does the body handle that, Bob? Now, I played at Northwestern. All the teams in college had AstroTurf. And, in fact, when I was in high school, everyone's like, oh, they have AstroTurf. You know, it's like basically they, they build it to all the players coming out of high school. Hey, we have AstroTurf. You're going you're gonna to play faster. You're going to, you know, uh-huh. you're going to look better, all that. And so everyone wanted to play in the AstroTurf. But it did take off a lot of skin. You know, I still have, uh, see, Randy Walker, one of the things besides giving me the expectation to play in the NFL, he gave me, uh, <laughs> we used to do this drill every day where you had to like do up downs, basically yeah. chop your feet and then fall on your stomach holding a ball. So you always... Land. Yeah, you're showing me scars on the back of your left hand here. Yeah, yeah, right. You land on the same spot every day. And and so I always had, like, all season long, had a scab there. You know, that's what the AstroTurf does. 
I didn't at the time, you know, I thought, Hey, this is great. You know, like in, in high school, you know, you, as a running back, you hate it when you try to make a cut and you lose footing and you slip and fall, you know? So you love being able to make those cuts. Now, you know, it does wear on your, your ankles and your, your knees more uh-huh. too. So, um, it's hard, but one of the things I learned, you know, like, like my high school practice field, um, and they didn't have the money to, um, you know, you don't have money in high school, most high schools to, you know, have sprinklers. So by the end of the season, our practice field was basically hard packed mud with little clumps of grass every here and there. And I still remember when I was in high school after practice, you know, I'd come home, I eat and I could barely stand up after dinner because, you know, your, your joints kind of stiffen up after resting and because my, my knees hurt so bad. When I signed a scholarship in college, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play four years in college if, you know, my knees hurt this bad now. Oh. You know, like our practice fields in college were much nicer. And even okay. playing on the AstroTurf, when, you know, we had some practice on the AstroTurf. It didn't hurt as bad as like, okay. you know, like a hard packed dirt field that's not, you know, especially when you got little, cl- you know, you're always right. turning your ankles. So um, I liked it. You know, the, the field turf is much better now. I mean, it, it is. And it, it does save your joints, especially for older players. So you played three years in Chicago. Uh, one of those years was under Mike Ditka. At some point after the third season, right, you were left unprotected Yes. for the expansion draft, mm-hmm. and that's how you ended up on the Carolina Panthers, correct? Yes. How does that feel as a player to, to be left exposed? Because I always think... Not good. <laughs> yeah, but, but, and I think of the guys who don't get drafted that end up back with, in this case, would have been back with the Bears. Right. How would you have felt... In other words, would you have rather been left unprotected and back with the Bears, a team that obviously didn't have a full commitment to you, right, or no. on a team that is destined to be terrible. No, I, I, was, I was very mixed because, you know, when Chicago picked me up, I was so thankful. And I loved playing for Dicka. Dicka was, to me, he's like one of the best coaches, one of the best football icons ever. You know, not just because he's got sure. all the notoriety, but, but he's, got the, he's got the heart yeah. of a football player. He's almost like a grandpa who can be very stern and angry, but at the same time really loves you. And he's a competitor. I got got to play. I got to start my career with Ditka and it with Dan Reeves. Oh my goodness. That's great bookends right there. And two of the most competitive people there, there are in sports. I mean, as, as coaches, as players, everything, even as playing cards, I heard story goes that I don't know if it's true or not, but they were playing cards in, in the facility after, you know, like a Friday practice or something. And, and, and Dan won. And they, 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 they love to compete with each other, too. And, and, and Dicka got so mad, he picked up through the, through the chair, and the, and the four legs went through the drywall and just stuck in the wall. Um, <laughs> again, I don't know if that's just uh, urban legend or, uh, or two, real. but um, I can believe it. I can yeah. believe it that, you know, they were that competitive. And playing college ball in Chicago, you know, you, you always, you know, when Dicka was the head coach, you know, you, you, you see – all season long, whenever he lost it and chewed somebody out, you see it every day in the news. You know, they, they'd be talking about it every day. Mm-hmm. And, and so when, when the Bears signed me, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, like, <laughs> oh, no. oh. you know, like just don't, he's I'm, if I do anything wrong, man, I'm, I'm going to get it, you know. And Mike Ditka is going to make an and, example out of me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he never raised his voice. Oh, wow. You know, he. It was just all business, and and you know, like when he talked to us, he he'd often he'd say, you know, most of us, you know, if we weren't here, we'd be sweeping a floor somewhere. You know, he he had a real appreciation for the blessing that we all had to be able to play a game, mm-hmm. and and get paid to do it. He loved the game of football. He was very grateful for what the game gave him. He when he played, and Dan, you know, they they played from their heart. They loved the game and. And yeah, they use their mind, but you know, in, in the end, it's all, it's, it's Dan, even in practice, you know, he would, you know, every team, like kind of at the beginning of practice, the offense will run a few plays on air, just kind of, I don't know why, but like when we're doing that, um, he, he would always be on the other side playing like he's a middle linebacker calling out the formations, <laughs> you know, he loved to play like, like, That's cool. you know, he, he had fun with football. He was really good at teaching how to have fun the right way. And the year we went to the Super Bowl, we had a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah. So, but how did you end up? Uh, you just had the one year stint with Carolina, and then you yep. ended up in Atlanta. How did that come to be? Where you were playing for Dan Reeves in Atlanta? I really played that yeah, the first year in, in Carolina. You know, the next year I actually was injured, so I, I was on injured reserve, okay. and, then, and then I was a free agent. And Dan brought me to, to Atlanta to interview me, and he's a class act. Mm-hmm. 
um, he's an honest man, which is hard in the position he had. You know, he had control over personnel and all that. And, and so you never want to be around him on cut day because he's a caring man. He lets himself care about those players he know he has to cut, where most coaches don't. They just like, I'm not going to get close to anybody because it hurts too bad if I cut him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pin a notice up on the bulletin board. Right. If you see your name, have a nice life. Right. Yeah. But Dan Reeves... It's so obvious. He's a man of integrity. He's right. a man of emotion and connections. Which right. I mean, and this is just an outsider. I, I don't know him like you do. Just from yeah. the outside looking in, he seems like such a genuine human being. I can only imagine what it's like to have him as a boss. I mean, that, that's true. That's it right there. He is. You know, what you see is what you get. Like Mike, he gets emotional in a game because it comes out. But he's not going to tell you one thing to your face. And then do something else, stab you in the back or say something else to the press or say something else. You know, he, he's going to tell you the truth. And, and so I, I came in and he said, you know, I want to be honest. You know, Craig Hayward's our first choice. You know, he's been with us. You know, he, Ironhead. You, we, yeah. And I actually <laughs> played with him in Chicago, too. Oh, wow. Cool um, but, but then he went to Atlanta and I went to Carolina. And, you know, and, and he had Ironhead did really good in Atlanta. He got free of alcohol, which was holding him back. And, and then, he, you know, he played really well. But Dan said, you know, he's our first choice, but we've offered him as high as, you know, we want to go. And if he doesn't take it, then we want you. So I really admired. They're like, wow, you would lay all your cars out there. That, that was amazing. And so Ironhead ended up signing with St. Louis. And then, you know, the Falcons signed me. Just true to their word, you know, which... Um, and you're still considered a halfback at this point? Oh, no. Okay, because so, uh, I was going to say, because I only know you as a fullback. Right, but right. When did that transformation happen? Okay, so... You know, my first year with the Bears, I was a tailback. I'm, I'm playing scout team tailback. So I'm Barry Sanders, you know, the week we play Detroit. You know, uh-huh. I'm, I'm the tailback. That next year, Dicka got fired mm-hmm. and Wanstead came in. He looked at me and, and he thought, well, I wonder if he can gain some weight and play fullback. I'm not sure what he saw in me, you know, without seeing me play, that, that would make him think that I would be a better fullback than tailback. But I don't know. Had you had you done much blocking at this point in your career? I No. Um, so I, I had to learn. I had to really learn the position in the NFL, which was extremely difficult. And actually, when the Falcons drafted me, they, they ran the run and shoot, which was you know, one back offense mostly. That's right. You don't even need a fullback. Brother. But for a short yardage or goal line, you know, they had a two back offense and they had me playing fullback in that. And, and I still remember... You know, that, that rookie year, lining up across Jesse Tuggle. Oh, and, no, um, no. You know, and, and having to just come downhill and, um, hammer. and um, <laughs> boom, I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I, I told all my friends and family at that point, I said, you know, if I have to make a living, like, lead blocking, I'm going to find another line of work. <laughs> but I, I guess I kind of changed my mind after – after being out of it and, and getting getting the opportunity again. So, yeah, once that moved me to fullback, and it actually would turn out good for me, you know? Yeah, because uh, you, you, in Atlanta, when you were talking about getting picked up by Dan Reeves, and what what an incredible season 1998 was where you guys went 14-2, and two, mm-hmm. and in the course of that uh, emotional season, was that scary moment where Coach Reeves had his heart attack, but before the heart attack, is you got hurt, correct? The same game. The same game. Against the Saints. Yeah, in fact, part of me is like, was this fate? I mean, I don't know. I tore up my knee. It was fourth and one, and, and you know, the big old pile, and, and I got trapped. You know, I'm, I'm and, and somebody had a hold, a death grip on my lower leg, and then the rest of them... You know, I went forward for a bit, and then they they started pushing me back. And, and the guy on my legs, like, pushing the other way, and it just – it was like slow motion, you know, just it just more and more until it's finally boom. You know, it was it was awful. You know, after the game, Dan came in to check on me, you know, and, and, and I think he was trying to encourage me, you know, like oh, he said something about, yeah, he was feeling a little something pain. And you know, I said, hey, you better check that out, you know. And so he talked to the team doctor on the way home. Uh-huh. And, and said, hey, I'm feeling a little something. And the team doctor said, you're, going to the ho- you're not going home. You're going right to the hospital. And so like he called ahead. And as soon as they got home, he went and did emergency bypass. And it probably saved his life. Right. You know? That was There were several uh, issues going on yeah, yeah. in his heart. He had emergency bypass surgery. And um, I mean, it was, it was cool to see the whole team come together. Because I think, you know, of course, I'm out. Yeah. But, but, I mean, that had to, that, that stunk, huh? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. 14 and 2. You get. I think it was week fourteen. I looked this up where you got injured. Mm-hmm. You're almost to the finish line with this 
miracle run and you don't get to participate. Oh my goodness. But yeah. it was a great, you know, run, playoffs, Super oh, Bowl. Yeah. And and really the best part of that year was to get to be a part of an organization where everybody loved one another. And and you build that. And you could tell. And you have to build it every year. That's the thing. You know, we went through the year before, what, what people don't realize, the reason we went to the Super Bowl in 98 was because in 97, we started 0-6. But you and didn't finish 0-6. No, we started 0-6. <laughs> and, and, and at that, I mean, everyone in the world had already written us off anyway. All we had was each other. Mm-hmm. And so we circled the wagons. And, and Dan was a good steady and influence in that, that just every week, you know, he didn't make excuses for, for mistakes, but he didn't leave us without hope. In correcting our mistakes, he's like, hey, we're, we're going to turn that corner. We're, you know, we got to get better. You got to fix that. And so by the end of that year... I think you finished seven and nine, did you not? We did. Yeah. We did. We went on a roll at the end of the year, and we learned how to win. We learned how to believe in ourselves. That, that's the most important thing. We learned how to believe in ourselves. And we got a little full of ourselves, too. You know, there, there, there's a balance between confidence and humility, right? You know, you have to have confidence. You, have, you also need humility. And uh, we learned humility, I think it was the third game of 98, San Francisco took it to us. Literally. Yeah. I mean, really, they they embarrassed us. But but I would like to point out, uh, spoiler alert, the Falcons got them back. You were in the same division. Oh, yes, yes. And then you got them back again in yes. the playoffs. I'll, I, I'll brag for you. Well, <laughs> they taught us how to win. And this is where Dan was such a good coach. He knew what was needed at the right time. He knew when he hey, needed to back off and, you know, and, and have some fun. And he knew when, you know when what we needed when so so we had gone up there just thinking hey we're going to show up and do it and they they took it to us mm-hmm. on both sides of the ball the next monday you know we got to watch the film and, and normally you come all together you watch the special teams film all together the whole team because you know the guys get from defense and offense are on special teams and then you usually break up and you know the offense and defense of coordinators will kind of talk about the job that they did and what we need to do better and and then Usually you break up and you just watch it with your position coach and he points out all your mistakes and, and what you need to do to do better. And it's much better if there's only like six people watching you get chewed out than, you know, the whole offense. Uh huh. Because every once in a while, the, you know, we watch it as a whole offense. <laughs> this particular game, Dan had us watch it as a whole team wow. from start to finish every single play and he called out every mistake. He wanted our offensive guys to see the way their offensive guys are just – mercilessly chopping our defensive guys down. He wanted to see our defensive guys, how their their defensive guys are just, you know, relentless in their pursuit. You know, when we played them again, you know, it's like, hey, we played them like men. You know, before right. we thought we were something, we had had some success and we thought we were something, but we we really weren't playing with the, the total abandon and, and the, um, you know, quite on the same level as, as we did after that game. Well, I would like to point out that that Super Bowl season, the 1998 Atlanta Falcons, you were Sports Illustrated's fullback of the year. I was. That that, uh, You should have been a pro bowler. Just saying. (laughs) I'll say it. Well. I'll say it. I'll try to remember that year. (laughs) Uh, That was the one regret, you know, a disappointment of my career. I I wanted to go. Uh, I'll be honest. I wanted to go. I never went to Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii. Of course, you would have been in a walking boot, though, right? (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I don't know, yeah. That, that could... But but you would have still been able to go to Hawaii. Right. And that would have been a fun trip, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think. I don't know. I've never been there. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> but see, you're the Dirty Bird, which, let's just state the record, was invented by O.J. Santiago, correct? Am I wrong? Okay. It wasn't. No. No? Jamal Anderson. Well, he made it famous, right? No, it was a fa- it was It was a... Um, the dirty bird, the term dirty bird was created by a homeless guy. Um, wow. What now? Tell me more. Oh, you didn't know this? I just, okay, what, what I was going to say, and you're correcting me, I was going to say that I remember in the New England game, the first, the first time, and I will have to go and look this up to see if my memory serves, but the first time I, I saw it performed was the tight end, O.J. Santiago, doing it in the end zone in New England. But then after that, it was Jamal Anderson who made it famous. This is my memory. Okay. But, you know, Jamal Anderson's not scoring these touchdowns without Bob Christian right here <laughs> blocking for him up the middle there. Well, all right. So the, the evolution of the Dirty Bird. Okay. Early in that year, you know, we're lead, made the first game, first home game. 
we're leaving the stadium after a win. <laughs> and, and there was a homeless guy outside outside the stadium. Okay. He's like, he's like, yeah, you know, he's like, whose house is this? And we're like, this is the Falcons house. And he's like, no, it's a dirty bird's house. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and enough guys heard that. And it just kind of like, kind of clicked. Like yeah. that year, it's like, you know, no one ever gave us, you know, everyone said, oh, you know, Minnesota has all this talent. They said, well, you know, we're, we're just kind of sure. like, we don't have all the talent. We don't have all the flash, whatever, you know. Right. And so it, we kind of embraced it. To the point where you ended up 14 and two, yes. yet still had to play the NFC championship game on the road. How, how appropriate was that? No, it set up, <laughs> it set up just one of the most amazing events I've ever been a part of. I've never heard the story of the term Dirty Bird originating with a homeless guy outside the Georgia Dome. Yeah, so he did that, and then we kind of embraced it, and then Jamal Anderson came up with the dance. Okay. Um, You know, doing the, you know, and in fact, I still remember, um, I don't remember what, when in the season it was. I scored a touchdown. And, oh, oh and, I know. And then they gave me, like, he was like, come on, man, you got to do the dirty, you know, because I didn't, I just tossed the ball back to the ref and went, you know. Yeah. And he's like, you got to do the dirty, you know, everyone, you know. And, and so the game I got hurt in, before I got my, my knee injured, I scored a touchdown. And then I was like, oh, no, now I got to do that stupid dance. Oh. And, and I'm just so focused on like, oh, no. You got to do it. I got to do it. What am I, how does it go? And (laughs) so I get up and I go over, you know, wherever I was, I start doing this dance and I start looking around. I'm like, where is everybody? Because Jamal does it. All the guys come around, you know, I'm like, where is everybody? (laughs) Where's your crew? (laughs) Well, lucky for me, um, there was a fight. I didn't see it. There was a fight that had broken out on the other side of the end zone. Oh, the Saints. And so everyone was going there and the cameras. So, <laughs> so, so I didn't get caught. Why? Cause <laughs> as everyone that checks out this podcast knows, I referenced the email that I send out with the questions and in it, you listed this moment right now doing the dirty bird against the saints as one of your most embarrassing moments oh, yeah. ever. And I instantly, after I got this email from you, I went to you I went to YouTube, man, and I, I typed in, you know, Bob Christian, Dirty Bird Dance. I cannot find it, and now you're explaining why it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, the cameras, um, the TV cameras didn't catch it. Then our coaching film did, <laughs> and so um, I had a, and it was even worse that I'm over there all by myself, and, and everyone else is yeah. in the fight over here, and I'm like, just, oh, it's ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> That is so funny. Yeah. Do you have tape of this at your no, house? Oh. I, I have no desire for That's that. That's too bad. That's too bad. Actually, I did it I did it one other time. Uh-huh. When I was up in Chicago helping coach, you know, Northwestern's football team, we had a big game against Iowa. And the guys were coming, they kept, you know, all year long, they, they, they kept saying, hey, come on, do the dirty bird, do the dirty bird. Oh, no. And so I, I told them, okay, you beat Iowa, and, and I'll do the dirty bird. And, <laughs> and, and, and they, they won. I'm like... Okay, oh, now no. I got to do it. Is, so, uh, <laughs> is there footage of that nope, <laughs> anywhere? Okay, nope. very good. No, yeah. make so, sure, right? So I, I did it for for those guys. Hey, yeah. You you got Dan Reeves to do the Dirty Bird after yeah. the NFC Championship game. Yeah, 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 I remember that. So yeah, no, there is tape of that. I will but, say, but that was fun. You know that that whole year, you know the Dirty Bird, all that is part of it, and and, and it's all part of bring, building that family. You know, building that love and cohesion that where we will fight for each other. You know, and I told guys afterwards, I was coaching all the time. You have to love and care about one another. It was a beautiful year. Yeah, absolutely it was. As a fan, it, <laughs> it was the most magical of seasons uh, for the Falcons. You spent over a decade in the NFL, mm-hmm. most of them with the Falcons. Yes. It ended on a sour note for you and that you suffered a concussion in a game. Mm-hmm. And I, I know I remember that moment but you would never play again, correct? Nope. I mean, that was that was it. It was against Detroit. Yep. Yeah, it was, um, you know, there, there's some parts I don't remember because um, I was out. And my memory did, took a while to come back. Not not days or anything, but... It, but In the moment? Like the first thing I remember uh, distinctly after after that hit was riding in the ambulance, looking at my, my jeans and my, my shoes on me and, and wondering... Who dressed me? Oh, my. You know, because I'm like, oh, I was playing football, and now I'm, how did I get here? Now, I had taken a shower and gotten dressed, but, you know, my short-term memory wasn't recording. Yeah, that was the first I remembered after that. If my memory serves, I remember I was at a sports bar, 
And I feel like it was a cheap shot, I, I think. No. And no, it was not? Okay, so... so no, see the, I don't the, think so. Okay, describe that play for us. He hit my head with his forearm, coming, you know, but... Okay. I think I think he thought he had me. You know, he's coming from the inside. Yeah, this and my instinct, I, I I caught, you know, I, I caught a glimpse just at the last second, and then your instinct as a running back, you know, when there's going to be contact, is to lower down. And so he was coming with his head and and just going to wrap me up with his arms. Okay. I ducked down, and his arm coming across like my chin just gave a quick twist of my head. And the neurologist afterwards, he he, you know, I, I met with him. Uh, several times, and, and he said that, that a, a quick twist of your head is what knocks you out, not more than a, than a blunt force. Now, blunt really? force causes more, you know, could cause more memory damage or other damage, but, but a quick twist is what knocks you unconscious. And, and there is a cumulative effect. Here's what I want to ask you then, because you just said a cumulative effect. Yes. How many concussions have you had in your football playing career? Uh, you know... <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, I mean... No. It's, it's funny that um, Wikipedia, anybody can put anything up there, True. right? And so I know like at one point they said I had over 40 concussions in, in my career. And then actually I'm like, well, that's not true. And then I had a friend that said, oh, you just, anybody can put it up there. And so he went in and changed it, you know? And, oh, wow. and so he put it to <laughs> however many I thought I had, you know? And then, <laughs> and then, you know, a month later, it's back up to like, now it's 45, you know, someone put 45 in there, you know? And, who, um, who out there? I don't know. I don't is... know who's so concerned to give me concussions, but... But uh, I, I don't know. Oh, and, and then recently it became like I read something about like in college I had the most concussions in college. Or I don't know. Somebody wrote something about my college career said I had, you know, so many in college. I'm like, I did. I mean, I, re- <laughs> I remember like a couple, but, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know who's 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 saying that stuff. And the cumulative effect there, you know, it's, it's more like getting knocked out. It's like the more you get knocked out, the easier you you are to get knocked out. Uh-huh. And so what the doctor said, and I already knew, like, I, I told you my first memory was like, oh, I'm in my jeans and my shirt, you know, and of course I'm like, oh, right, somebody, oh man, I thought like, <laughs> thought Harold had had to <laughs> bathe me and, and dress me, you know, <laughs> um, and that was one of her trainers, you know, and, um, but, uh, but then my next thought, you know, was, and I knew, you know, I knew I'd been playing, I knew, okay, and I, I just knew, I just had just a, it was, it was actually a piece, I, I'll describe, it came over me, all right, that's it it's over. I'm done. And, and it was kind of like, it was almost like a relief because, you know, like the prior two or three years, I started to think, okay, how's this going to end? Mm-hmm. You know, like either there's, there's only one of three ways a professional career can, can end. You walk away while you're still able to play. And that would be really hard for me, especially, you know, as much as I care about my team and if they still want me and, and I can still help them, couldn't do that. Two, they, they show you the door. You, you're just not able to do it anymore. They show you the door. Ooh, that'd be even worse, right? <laughs> and then three is you get injured, you can't play anymore. So in reality, that, that to me was the easiest way out. And that's what, not that I, I didn't choose it, but. Right. but um, that was the 2002 season? That was, yeah, the 2002 okay. season. And I never look back though. I, I have no regrets. You know, I'm, I'm very thankful. And after, after the, the concussion happened, you know, and I'm living in Atlanta and, I don't know where I was. I was, I was driving somewhere and I, I just saw a building that like, I think when I came from my mini camp, you know, like back when I was a rookie, we went there for some reason and I, it, it triggered that memory and it triggered a memory that I had totally forgotten about my whole career that on, on my way back to Chicago from that mini camp in Atlanta, I had, had said, all right, I need to make my goals. You know, what do I want to accomplish in the NFL? And, um, and, and the goals that I specifically came up with was I want to earn the starting job here in Atlanta and play six years. And, um, and I had forgotten that until, you know, I was driving somewhere in Atlanta, yeah. I saw that same building or whatever. And, uh-huh. it, and it reminded me that I had set as my goal to earn the starting job in Atlanta and play six years. And as you know, and uh, anyone following the, the timeline, it's maybe hard to do, but, but I, I played, you know, when Atlanta signed me back as their starting fullback, I played six years. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was um, really quite amazing. You know, it didn't come without heartache and pain and struggle and despair and, and you know, doubting, self-doubt, other doubt, you know. And, and, and that's what I hope. You know, I, I, I'm very thankful. I'm very, very thankful that I struggled as I did. 
um, before I made it. I wouldn't have played as long. There's sure. no way on earth I would have played that long. If I had made it right away, I wouldn't have even, that lasted six years. It's definitely not as a starter mm -hmm. um, because I wouldn't have been as hungry. I wouldn't, it wouldn't have meant as much to me. And, and even more than that, like since going through all that I went through, like everyone struggles in life. Mm -hmm. Success is basically struggling. If, if you're not struggling, you're not succeeding. I mean, there's, there's no way to succeed without struggle. But a lot of people are in that struggle and, and some people see no hope. They see no way out. And I am so thankful because I, I know that telling my story can give people hope, can give people belief to keep trying. And, that, and that's the difference really between succeeding and failing. And one of the years we, I got to go to South Africa and Zimbabwe with some other NFL players and we went and talked to kids and went to Kyalicha High School or the high school in Kyalicha, South Africa, which is one of the um, township, you know, it's areas where they had forced segregation and, and in this area, it's like shantytown. Mm. It's like tin and cardboard and sheet of plywood. You know, basically people live in these little shacks that, that you know, if, if a strong winds came by, they, they're going to blow down. Mm. And, uh, and we go to this high school to speak. And, and before we went, I'm like, what can I say to these kids? I mean, I have no idea the circumstances that they're in. And once you give up on your dreams, you give in to despair, you don't have anything. Yeah. And, and, and you're really a dead man walking or, or you have a lot of regrets or, or you harbor anger and bitterness. And, and then that comes out towards other people. So, so the, 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 the thing we need the most as people is, is hope and hope for a better tomorrow, hope that you know, good will come, you know, even out of, out of hardship. If you go through failure early and you don't give up, those type of people have the most successful careers. And, and so what we need, all of us, is we need to hang on to that hope. It's only over when you, when you give up. And I know that you get a lot of that hope from your faith, correct? Well, that ultimately, yes, because without that, like if, if we're just a bunch of, you know, molecules stuck together here, like flying through the universe, no purpose, that, that it's all an accident and, and what, what really matters. I mean, but if there is a God who created the earth just right to habitate human life um, and, and that he, he has a plan and, and that if, if that God also loves me, and, and that he has a plan for me. And my dad, my dad, he didn't just like, well, whatever you want to do, kid. And he guided me. He shepherded me. He cared about me. He, my dad cared about me. Um, I have a God that cares about me. I have hope. I can go through hard times. My, my dad, he put me through hard times at times, you know, <laughs> you know, but, but he, he guided me. He, he, he knew, and, and God knows sometimes you have to go through hard times to, to get to the great success like like nobody wins a super bowl nobody wins a, a world series nobody wins anything without going through pain you have to go through pain and you don't want to go through the pain but you have to go through pain to have the success and 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 so pain and suffering isn't always doom and gloom if you have that hope and if you believe that this is just part of 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 teaching me what i need to do to to have ultimate success later your family is very important to you. Definitely. Tell, tell us about Robin and your kids. Oh, yes. Uh, my, my wife, Robin, um, I, I could go on too long. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep this short. But um, And that was a struggle for me, too, because I didn't meet her until like the end of my career. And, and the whole time, and maybe I was too picky. I don't know. You know, like I most of my career, you know, it's like, you know, I had a pretty high standard for who I wanted to marry. And um, and so I finally met Robin like just before my last season. And I really didn't. You know, I met her at church just like a couple Sundays before I couldn't go to church anymore. And at the time, I thought she was too young and she thought I was too old. And, and, <laughs> and you know, it was kind of like, although I, there was a spark, there was definitely a spark. And then um, she thought I played for a college team, though. <laughs> uh, wow. So she told her brother-in-law, her, she was talking to her sister and her brother-in-law was listening in. And she's Wait, saying, I met this guy, who plays football for some college team, the Falcons, or, you know. And, you're too old. Come and, on, how'd that work out? And, and so, well, she, yeah, she was doing her internship out of college <laughs> and I was about to retire. So we were like in very different places in life. And, and, but, uh, as I got to know her, you know, cause we went to the same church and we both helped out like with the, with the, the youth group. And after getting, being around my wife, you know, and I'm just like, man, she is everything that I could want, you know, and, and maybe the age doesn't really matter, you know? <laughs> and really, that's really a theme of my life. I am so blessed 
but it was everything that is good and important to my life came through struggle. I had to wait a long time and, and a lot of questions like, God, where's, where is she? And then, you know, kids, like we said, okay, we're ready to have kids and we we're just going to let it happen. And then it was just kind of like, it wasn't happening. Oh, and, and, yeah. and, it, and it took a while. And now you and, have four great kids. Yeah. And, uh, ages five to 11, correct? Yes. Uh, my, my, my son is five and then I got three daughters, um, 11, nine and, and seven. You're going to have three teenage girls at the same time. I know. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I joke with like, um, th- there might be a time where I want to be, uh, you know, uh, away from home for a week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I wanted to ask you, obviously your talents lie in football. You have a brain for electrical engineering. I want to talk to you about your current profession here in just a moment. But before we get to that, you also play, all right? <laughs> The piano, the guitar, the trumpet, and the hammer dulcimer. Is that right? This yeah. is like some yeah. ancient instrument. I had to Google image this thing. I mean, this is an old school thing. Yeah, it's, it's, um, all right. Well, you have to blame Rich Mullins for that. Uh, I don't know if you ever. I'm very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Rich, um, he was my favorite recording artist. And so he played one of those, huh? Yes. I can't remember the name of the song, but he, it was just this beautiful intro. And, and I was just like, and I've been a music fan. I love music. Um, and um, I heard that, and I'm like, what is that instrument? And I, and I had to look it up, too, and I, and I found it. And I'm like, wow. And then when I was uh, playing for the, the Panthers, I went hiking up in um, Chimney Rock, in, like in the Appalachians. And I'm up there hiking, and I heard that. I heard that sound. I'm like, ah, someone's playing a hammer dulcimer. And I, and I hiked down to where they were. And he's, there was this guy up there. And it's it a folk instrument. So it's like, that's where it was always preserved up in the um, Appalachians. And, and he's playing away. I'm like, oh, man. And so he talked to me. He's here. He showed me how to do it. And I'm wow. like, oh, yeah, I could pick this up. You know, so, so I went and bought one. And, you know, and I learned how to play, you know, a couple of those rich songs. But I'm, I would not. Uh-huh. You know, the, the problem with the hammer dulcimer is there's no like a piano you hit the note you lift it and, and and there's a little cloth thing that comes down and dampens that that string right hammer dulcimer you hit it and it just rings and it keeps ringing and if you hit the wrong one it just keeps ringing <laughs> <laughs> for a while you know but it's so I, I never had to i've never performed on it but okay but um music for me in a lot of ways it started in college i mean i, I obviously i played like piano and trumpet from grade school on and I took lessons and, you know, for a while it was work, but then, especially when I was in college, it became, you know, I'd go down the piano room in the dorm and that's how I relieve stress, you know, wow. you know, you lose yourself in the music and it just, it, it gave me a, a respite of <laughs> worrying about Fourier transforms and, and, you know, um, you know, all that, all that stuff I was having to <laughs> yeah. try to learn. And in addition to the musical talents, you juggle. <laughs> and you have a unicycle. My wife bought herself a unicycle a couple of years ago, but she's yet to put enough time into it to really be proficient. How did you go about teaching yourself how to ride the unicycle or have you? <laughs> it's funny. Like when I was a kid, I always had this dream. I wanted to ride a unicycle, you know, and, and then when I started playing football, I was always like, well, I, I don't want to do something stupid and hurt myself, you know, and there's a few things I'm like, all right, I'm going to put that off till after I get done playing football. And well, fortunately, I guess it, it took me a while to finish. And, <laughs> and so after I finished playing football, I kept thinking, man, I really want to, it still is. I want to, I want to, I want to learn to ride the unicycle. Why not? I mean, who doesn't want to learn how to ride a unicycle, right? But uh, <laughs> I would hurt myself. Like, like you said, that would be me. Well, but to be honest, in the whole process of learning, I fell to the ground once. Hmm. Um, because in a, when you're riding a unicycle, like, you know, it's not like a bike as much, but if you fall forward on the unicycle, you just, you land on your feet, right? You know, the, the seat just goes forward and, yeah. oh, and you just land on your, if you fall backwards, you, you just land on your feet. Now that's a problem for men because as, as you're coming back, if you like step off with the wrong foot, it accelerates the, the unicycle into you. And if you're falling backwards, that's a little uncomfortable, <laughs> but, um, but it really, it's not, it's not as dangerous as people think. Okay. And, and so I, I, well, you don't know me, I would find a way to injure myself. Well, maybe, sure. but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my, actually my wife and my roommate, my, he was my best friend growing up and we lived together in Atlanta before, 
I kicked him out when I got married. <laughs> yeah. You know, they both of them got tired of hearing me talk about it. And so for my birthday one year, they, they went in together. They bought me a unicycle. And then, nice. so then I'm like, oh man, because it was a nice one too. I'm like, oh man, you know, they spent money on this. I'm like, I better learn to ride it. So, um, so I just went on my back deck and I had a little rail and I just went back and forth, back and forth, you know, hundreds of times. And then, and then finally one day, Hold on, were you with the Falcons at this time? I was retired. I was going to say, did, yeah. they, did they find out what you were doing? Okay. No, I was retired. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, one day I I just, I went out on the street and I thought, you know, and I didn't think I was good enough to do it, but the first time I just let go of the rail and just, I, I went about 400 yards. I mean, and, and part of it is trying to, the safety of the rail kind of skews your balance. You know, you, you're kind of like leaning over and it's harder actually uh, at first, you got to just to get used to the balance forward and back. But anyway, okay. um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm cool. kind of a skill junkie. I like to uh -huh. acquire just... Do you ever just take the unicycle out for a ride for the fun of it or... Yeah, for exercise. And, and it's, it's, it's great exercise because okay. yeah. your core is constantly working to kind of keep your balance. And yeah, um, especially while you're learning. Like once you get better, you don't have to work as hard. Yeah, I, I used to like... You've been snow skiing? Yes. Um, and you know how you you get that burn, and mm -hmm. it's hard because your 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 legs are burning, but you got to control, mm -hmm. and it's hard to control when they're burning, and so the, the unicycle is kind of a similar see, demand. Yeah. So like whenever getting ready to go snow skiing, I'll um, especially when I lived in Georgia, we had a we lived on a little bit of a hill, and and so I would just ride it up and down the hill, even going downhill. You know, you're kind of pushing backwards as your feet go forward. You know, and, and you get tired, but you have to you have to maintain control or you're going to fall, right? So it's yeah. it's very similar. So, How did you get into your current vocation, which is you are a private pilot? Well, I'm a commercial pilot for a charter company, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, private pilot, technically, you know, you get a private pilot license and you get a commercial pilot oh, license. Oh, okay. So a private pilot license means that, hey, you can fly yourself wherever you want to go. I got you now. Okay. Um, so, so it's not, okay. not as a career. That's where... I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah so... Yeah. So how did you get into this world? I've always wanted to fly. Huh. And um, I got my pilot's license actually um, right after I retired. I had started training the year before. And then I took my check ride. Actually, I think the same month I announced my, <laughs> my retirement. And I really... I knew in my heart that's what I wanted to do. But I'm a family man. And, and sometimes it's hard with families and and I, I talked to Arthur Blank, who owns a Falcon. I talked to his pilots, and I became pretty good friends with with them. And they had me down in the hangar and all that. And then, you know, and I was asking, like, well, what's it like for your family? What's you know? And 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 he said, man, it's funny you ask that. You know, my my grown daughter just told me the other day, Dad, you know, growing up, the only thing we can count on you for was we couldn't count on you. And uh, and that just, you know, it kind of broke my heart because I'm like, I want to be there for my my kids and family. So then, I had some other men that were trying to help advise me and say, hey, why don't you just go work with your brother? Because that was the other thing I was thinking about is working with my brother, training young athletes, which obviously I knew a lot about and, and I did like too. And so for a while there, I went and worked with him and just thought, hey, I can fly on the side for fun, you know? And But as life happens, you know, I wasn't having, I was having less and less time to go fly and it, it was coming, you know, causing more and more conflict with my wife too. Like, you know, for me to take time away from her and the kids to go, you know, even if I try to take someone with them, but they didn't have the interest like I did. And so finally I went to Oshkosh, which like the, the air venture fly in that happens every year in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, anyone that loves or even thinks they love aviation. It's like, it's aviation heaven, really. Wow. It is. And, um, I went there and I was hooked. <laughs> I was like, I have to find a way to do this for a living, you know? And here you are. And, and so, and my brother was a supporter too. He understood and my wife too, and and she she has a lot of faith too. And I I knew that like it may may be tough on the family. I may have to be gone some, and you know, and but but she she was uh, you know I, I love that woman that she's willing to walk with me and willing to sacrifice for me, to, um, and and to be supportive of, of of my dream. And that's cool. It's like Brazos Valley Air Charter is our official name, and so I I just have one more question for you, along the lines of being a pilot. One of the things that you put in the email when I asked the question, what is something you want to accomplish in your lifetime? And you said you want to build an airplane. Yes. I mean, obviously you don't go down to the Home Depot and start buying stuff and, and take it back home. How, how, how does one go about building something as complicated as an airplane? Well, I mean, the, the easy way or the easiest <laughs> way is you buy a kit that um, really? 
right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I didn't even think of that. I, yeah, yeah. There, there's I'm a whole bunch of um, there's a whole bunch of kits out there, good ones. Some of the best airplanes are are um, ex- they call them experimental. If it's a so in legal terms, airplanes can be either certified airplanes. So the FAA is certifying that this has been built to the standards of the FAA. Okay. You know, so it's a certified airplane. Then there's experimental airplanes, which there's no guarantee. You know, it could fall apart or, you know, but, you know, you build it. You know, you build Uh it, you fly it, right? (laughs) You know? (laughs) And you're liable. Right, right. And the nice thing is to make sure if if the FAA is going to certify that this airplane is good for manufacture and and spread out, you know, there's there's tons of regulations. And paperwork, I, I actually talked to a man who, he was a missionary, who built an airplane, who designed an airplane for missionary work. But, you know, he said the stack of paperwork to build that airplane was like bigger than an airplane, you know? (laughs) Um, I mean, they had to document every nut, every bolt, and you had to specify, yeah, you have to specify for every part, it has to be that bolt. If it's going to be a certified aircraft, like if that bolt breaks off and you want to replace it, you have to replace it with that bolt, which, you know, you get a bolt from Home Depot for what, 20 cents, 20, you know, whatever, but that, that bolt's going to cost you six bucks or whatever, or maybe even 20. I don't know. So there's certified aircraft and then there's experimental aircraft, okay. which experimental there's, they don't have as many regulations, but you can't operate an experimental aircraft commercially. You know, it, most, most of these take over a thousand hours of, of built building hours, you know, to, to put them together. And, and it takes, you know, I, I, most people, it takes years. Some, some, a lot of people start it and then it gets put on the back burner for a while, and then you know, some unfortunately, you know, a lot of people start and never finish it. And you got to have a lot of space to build a plane and to lay out all right, the parts right. and stuff, right? It is hard, and um, yeah, I I keep thinking I want to, and then I keep thinking when. Yeah, I, I don't have time as it is. Except that, you know, this is this is my hope that um, that if any of my kids have the interest in doing it too. You yeah, know, because, farm it out. Because right? then, well, not no, not farm it out. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I meant experience it with them. <laughs> Do it with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, if I was the only one interested, I'll never build it until they until they're gone. You know, right. we only have so many time with our kids. I, I think about that still today. In my 11 year old, you know, it's like okay, seven more years, and she's she's going. Seven years isn't long, and um, you know, we only have so much time with them. You know, and, and I I see everything as a teaching opportunity. You know, I hope that they get the bug to want to build it too. You know, and, yeah. Because hey, we do it together. Sure. You know, how many less a lot of bonding too yeah. yeah but how many lessons will come up in building that airplane together and boys learn through doing things with men oh, absolutely. you know i mean my son he can't sit down and concentrate on a math book but you turn him loose out in the garage and he gets his hands on tools and Right. And, and and starts building things. Right. That is the kind of, that's where they thrive. And even like, even the FAA, like the FAA um, has adopted recently um, a new method of testing and, and therefore training too. Um, and, and it's all scenario based. So instead of saying, you know, this is an aileron and it, it does this and it makes the airplane do that, you know, and, and these are the rules for this and just memory, it's, it's all scenario based. And so, so when they test, they say, okay, you're flying along and, and the, um, you get a low volt light comes on, you know, what do you do? <laughs> and, and so now it's not just, I've memorized a bunch of facts. Um, it's like, okay, you know, you put yourself in that scenario and, and you say, all right, what does that mean? And, um, why, why would that come on? And, you know, hopefully they know the answer. <laughs> and, and, and so it, it's all like scenarios, um, which, which I think, you know, it, it goes well to, to all life. Like, okay. You know, cause a lot of people need to understand, like if you understand why you're learning something and, and what scenario it's going to apply to, it, it has a lot more meaning. You know, if you're just studying, learning all the systems and, and knowing that, all right, so the alternator, the engine turns the alternator, the alternator charges the battery and, and you know, whatever you might just like, okay. But, but if you know that, okay, if the low volt light comes on, it means your alternators fail, you know, like, Right. Suddenly you're going to like, Ooh, I better, I better know that. I better Uh understand what that means and what I need to do. And I had students before said, what would you do? Oh, emergency landing. I'm like, why? You know, (laughs) your engine's still running, but you know, it's like, you know, basically, yeah, they, they would have like set it down in a field or something. I'm like, no, you know, (laughs) but anyway, they call it EAA, the experimental aircraft association. And they're the ones that put on this, this big shebang up in, in, um, in, in Oshkosh and you go up there and it'll be like the best people 
You've ever, I mean, it's it's like talk about innovation. And my father-in-law went, and he's you know an aircraft mechanic. And I went with my my two dads, you know, my my, my dad and my father-in-law, and he he took note. I don't know, twenty thousand people invade this little town in in, in Wisconsin. And you have to sleep in like tents or, or campers, you know, wow. out in these farmer fields. And there's all these, it's a big crowds, right? And he's like, there's no trash anywhere. It's it's a wonderful. Does you know, everybody group fly of their own planes up there to this? Um, a event? lot of people do. They, yeah, you <laughs> could, where do they park them all? <laughs> well, they have, they ha- I mean, it's amazing. The volunteers that they have to pull this thing off is really amazing. They, they, but this, it's so organized. You got to go. Okay. You got to go. Right. I'll go sometime. Yeah, no, I, you may not care anything about aviation, but but it's it, it's actually an event to see, just to see how all this gets pulled off and, 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 and how passionate, like it takes so many people that are so passionate about it. Um, and it's really, to me, it's like some of the best people in America, you know, and, yeah. and, and they, a lot of these experiment, a lot of people build a plane and they fly it up there, you know, and to talk about the dedication you don't just like go in the workshop in a, in a couple nights and put it together most of them and what's the name of the event again it's called the uh air venture um yeah, just air venture 2000 whatever you know, 2021 sure. the next okay. one right well um i cannot thank you enough for making time uh to do this here um so gracious uh, and i appreciate you uh taking the time to walk us through uh so much fun stuff in your life and it's been great getting to know you, Bob. Yes. Um, I, I, I do want to know, though, you've played for three NFL teams. When Sunday rolls around, which NFL team are you rooting for? I have to be honest. It's Atlanta. All right. I mean, know he's a Falcons it's, fan. It's Atlanta. Um, I do. Um, and it's abusive relationship, though, for us Falcons fans. Uh, having... Well, <laughs> have faith. Okay. okay. Have faith. <laughs> All right, no great success comes without struggle, right? There it is. There it is. <laughs> Bob Christian, um, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I do appreciate you know the Bears and the, and the Panthers. Um, you know the Bears gave me their st- my start in the league, and then you know the Panthers were really good to me while I was there. So I can't say anything bad about them, but you know, it's just my six years in Atlanta and playing for you know the, the organization was more like family. Mm-hmm. So the, the, they they got my heart. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. All right. Well, Bob Christian, thank you so much for making time with me here on At The Mic. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with former Atlanta Falcon fullback Bob Christian. I know it was an absolute thrill for me to talk to a guy who is a part of so many of my best memories as a fan of the Atlanta Falcons. Today, as you heard him mention, he flies for Brazos Valley Air. Uh, you give him a call if you'd like to be flown around by a former NFL fullback. And I tell you, that is going to do it for this season of At The Mic. That's right, we are done with this season, but I'll be back on January 15th, 2021, if you would like to make a note. January 15th, 2021. In the meantime, I hope you will use the next couple of months to catch up on any shows you may have missed along the way. Be sure to share At The Mic with your friends. And please don't forget to subscribe to this podcast as well, and you will be notified when we have new episodes. I'll see you back here on 1-15-21 with a whole new season of interviews of people I'd like you to meet. Until January 15th in season number two, thanks so much for being a part of At The Mic. Mr. Nick Daly, take it away. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Look for At The Mic Show on Twitter to connect. 